Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak in the, in the seminar. So uh, let's consider the, the 2D Navier-Stokes equation, which I, which I write in, uh, in the vorticity form like that. Omega is the vorticity and uh, U is the corresponding uh, velocity field. And there is a very simple uh, solution of this equation, namely just the uh, heat current. If you uh, skip the nonlinear term here, it's just the heat equation. You substitute uh, the heat kernel. Uh, and uh, it's easy to, to check that the nonlinear term vanishes if, if you substitute the heat kernel for omega. So we have a genuine uh, uh, solution of the Navier Stokes, one of the one of the textbook uh, solutions, uh, one of the explicit solutions that you can uh, find in, in textbooks. It has a it, it has a, a universal feature uh, to it, which is uh, which is uh, the following: if you take now any solution of uh, the Navier Stokes equation, not necessarily this one, just any solution. And uh, rescale it uh, like this. Uh, so this is the scaling at the level of vorticity, which preserves uh, the equation. You see the initial condition scales in uh, in this way, which is the same scaling as the Dirac mass. So if you take large lambda and take lambda to infinity, the initial con uh, condition will converge to a Dirac mass. And if you expect uh, good behavior of the solution then uh, the, the rescaled solution will converge to our uh, simple solution given by the, uh, the heat current. So you see that if this uh, hand waving uh, is, is correct, then actually on the big scale, any solution of the, of the 2D Navier-Stokes, uh, which has a non-zero uh, total vorticity, should look like that if you look, uh, if you look uh, from a distance. So this is true, uh, but it's not uh, not uh, easy uh, to prove. It was uh, proved uh, some time ago by Thierry uh, Gallet and, and Gene Wayne. And one of the one of the issue which comes up is uniqueness of this simple solution, which I was uh, uh, which I was discussing. So it's easy to see when you do the rescaling that the initial condition converges to a Dirac mass. But if you want that uh, the equation forces the solution to be our simple solution, then you have to have uniqueness for, uh, for this initial datum as the Dirac mass. In particular, uh, the, the question is that if you have a solution of 2D Navier Stokes, say, which is bounded in this space, so that means the vorticity is uniformly bounded uh, uh, in time in, in L1. And uh, let's just assume this solution is, uh, is smooth, uh, but uh, uh, not uh, with uh, estimates, just uh, C infinity. And that as you go, you, we have this estimate, and as you go to, to, uh, with time to zero, it converges in distributions to the Dirac mass. So can we say that it then has to be our solution? Again, this is true, uh, but uh, not, so easy, not so easy to, to prove. And in fact, if you if you look and if you embed this solution into three-dimensional space, so this we consider it as a two-dimensional solution, but you can also consider it in three dimensions. Then it is open if it uh, if uh, this uh, solution is uh, unique or not. There, there is a, a beautiful result uh, of of uh, Jacob Bedros and, and co-authors where they show that. Uh, there cannot be a, something in the direction that for, for this three-dimensional situation, there cannot be uh, non-uniqueness by uh, bifurcation. So in general, the velocity field, so the, the velocity field which we get here for this solution, the initial datum is minus one homogeneous. It's a minus one homogeneous function. And in general, for 3D Navier-Stokes, we don't expect uniqueness for minus one homogeneous solution. This is uh, this is uh, related to the conjectured non-uniqueness of uh, larry hopf solution. And there it is expected that one gets non-uniqueness by bifurcation. But here, what uh, Jacob and co-authors proved that uh, for this particular solution, you cannot get non-uniqueness by bifurcation, but there are, of course, uh, more possibilities than, than bifurcation. 
So if you go to self-similarity variables so that the, the solution which we have becomes a steady state. So we introduce these variables and the heat kernel just becomes a steady state. And then we are essentially interested in the stability of this steady state uh, solution, right? That's, that's a kind of like a necessary condition for uniqueness or for this uh, convergence, which I was, uh, which I was discussing is, uh, is the stability of uh, this steady state. So the, the way we approach it is, okay, we have a steady state solution. We write uh, the perturbed solution as the solution plus a small perturbation. And then we are inter substituted into the equation and are interested in the behavior of uh, this perturbation eta. Now, this is interesting at many levels. Uh, even for the linearized Euler, if, if one does uh, say, if one forgets these terms and, and does uh, uh, some elementary stability analysis, so, so one, can, one can do, for example, the mode stability analysis looking for growing modes. This, this is uh, a computation which was done in 19th century. It is uh, stable. And uh, even though if one does it in 3D, it's much more difficult even to do the mode analysis. And this was uh, done only recently. And in two dimensions, we have a good, uh, uh, good idea about the behavior of the linearized equation, but already in three dimensions, uh, the, the behavior of the linearized equation is not so, uh, not so easy to uh, describe. Um, and uh, a stability of proof of, uh, of, this, uh, of this solution uh, is essentially contained in the, in the result, which I, uh, which I mentioned by Thierry Gallet and, uh, and uh, Gene Wei. So uh, we were looking for, uh, for using, the, the, for, for, for using the, the, the techniques in, in, in that stability proof to slightly dif different situation. Uh, for example, we had in mind uh, the situation with, uh, with vortex rings. So that's, uh, that's another interesting solution of Navier-Stokes equation in which the initial datum instead, so, so if we now embed the previous solutions into, into three dimensions, right? So, so there in the, in the previous one, the, uh, the vorticity is concentrated on a line, say on the, on the X3 axis. And uh, it's, it's like a one dimensional current uh, sitting on, on that line. So we can, instead of, considering the vorticity on a line, we can consider a vorticity on a circle. And uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, should be another interesting uh, solution. And uh, th this time it's a little more complicated because the nonlinearity comes in right away from the beginning and uh, the, the solution wants to move. Uh, it's, uh, it, uh, it's usually called vortex, uh, vortex rings if you, uh, there, there are some, uh, some nice videos on, on YouTube. If you search, say, vortex rings and dolphins, for example, you find, uh, you find videos of uh, dolphins uh, actually uh, being able to create vortex rings such that uh, you have bubbles uh, of air here and you can see how this uh, how these object uh, moves and the, the dolphins uh, play with them actually. So, so it's, it's, it's really uh, a, a, an interesting uh, thing to, uh, to watch. And, and the behavior of, of this uh, vortex ring is quite, uh, quite fascinating. And, and the stability, especially the stability which they exhibit is, is really remarkable. <laughs> so we were, our, our motivation were, was kind of more modest. So, so one can show again the existence and uniqueness uh, in, uh, in this case in the class of axisymmetric solution for the for the string. So we, we did it with theory uh, some time ago. And uh, when you want to study, for example, the, uh, the, the behavior of, uh, of the solution as viscosity goes to zero, which, which we were interested in, then you, you find that the, the proof which is used for the, for the two-dimensional case, the, the stability and uniqueness proof, which would come very handy uh, in this situation, which is used in the two-dimensional case, 
uh, it's kind of hard to make it work in this situation. At least we didn't see how to uh, how to do it. In some sense, the the, the proof does not seem, at, at least we didn't see how to do it, to, to survive the following situation. Say you have some solution in the, in the exterior. Th this is an analogy, right? So with the vortex, it's a little bit different, but this is a simple analogy. That you, you have, say, a solution in, in, uh, the, in uh, the exterior of a circle, and you understand the stability there by working with some spaces and some, some weights and so on. And now you, you don't want to do any dramatic change just to deform the circle to some non-circular domain, okay? Do a small deformation so that the solution loses this, uh, this radial symmetry. One would expect that uh, the proof, uh, I mean, one would like to have a proof which will survive this deformation, okay? To, to have uh, still a proof uh, which would work uh, here, but which you could also deform into into this setting and we were not able to, to do it with the existing uh, proof. So we were, uh, we were uh, trying to, to find a different proof, which at least potentially could uh, in principle survive such deformation and then maybe could be used uh, in, in, uh, for the, say for the vortex ring and uh, things like that. So uh, th there is a, there is a, uh, method uh, by Arnold uh, to to prove stability of uh, Euler uh, of Euler solution, which is uh, which is based on the geometric uh, consideration and uh, uses a little bit of uh, of the structure in uh, in the Euler equation. It is uh, similar to. Uh, what uh, and, and what what we uh, what we try to do is to use these ideas of uh, Arnold, the, the geometric ideas about stability, see if uh, if they can work in uh, in this uh, situation. So let me very briefly uh, re recall the the ideas. It's uh, we we will not really as as you will see we will not really need uh, any deeper kind of geometric uh, things there but it's still useful to uh, uh, to to recapitulate a little bit so uh, the the Arnold's the, the setup Arnold uses is is that that your configuration space is a group so if if one considers for example a rigid body uh, fixed at a point is a group uh, SO three or one can consider say just a rigid body, then it's the Euclidean group, right, E3, or you can consider, I don't know, rigid body in a hyperbolic space, then it's the SL2C or something. So you consider, and for, for Euler equation, it is uh, the group of diffeomorphisms, volume preserving diffeomorphism. So that's our configuration space. Then we have uh, kinetic energy defined on it, which is to say, in, uh, in the case of these finite dimensional groups, that would be left invariant, invariant under the left shifts of the, uh, of, uh, uh, the, the, on, the, on the group. And the corresponding phase space is the cotangent, uh, the, the corresponding uh, cotangent bundle as usual. And because of the, the invariance you have, uh, so this is the usual, the, here you have the usual symplectic structure and everything and uh, the dynamical system, the, the corresponding dynamical system. But there is a huge symmetry group, namely the group G itself acts on its left, left uh, by left shifts. Roughly speaking, if you have a solution of a rigid body fixed at a point, you rotate it by a group, it's still a solution. And so you can, you can uh, do a symmetry reduction uh, and mod out uh, by the symmetry and uh, from this, uh, what, uh, what remains from this uh, phase space then is just the Lie algebra, the dual of the Lie algebra. And uh, the, the symplectic structure does not survive this uh, reduction in, in some sense. Uh, it, instead of symplectic structure, we get only the Poisson uh, structure. That means that the, that, the, that the Poisson bracket is degenerate. Okay, it does not have uh, full run. So, then the, the situation, roughly speaking, is, uh, is uh, in, if we think about this as, as the phase space, the situation is the following. It is foliated into 
uh, into submanifold, which are which are uh, co-adjoint orbits, but this will not be really important uh, for us. Uh, and uh, each of these submanifolds is, uh, in some sense, a symplectic uh, uh, manifold of its own. If you start your evolution on it, you, you stay on it, and uh, so you can view this as a, as a family of uh, symplectic uh, manifolds, and uh, you have evolution on each manifold. And without even going to some deeper structure of this, you, you can, for, for, for Euler equation, there, there is an important, uh, an important point which, uh, which this uh, brings up, namely that uh, the steady state solutions of the Euler equation come in families, right? That if you have a steady state solution of Euler equation, say that means you have a critical point of the Hamiltonian of, of, of the energy on one of these, uh, one of these leaves, and uh, the, the critical point is non-degenerate, then it will not disappear if you move to, to the neighboring leaf, right? It will, you, will have, you will have a family of steady states which will have the same dimension as, uh, as is the co-dimension of these orbits. So you see that, uh, that the solutions of steady state solutions of Euler should be coming in these families of course, uh, in the situation of Euler, everything is uh, infinite dimensional, but roughly speaking, these families are parameterized for Euler in two dimensions by one function of one variable. Okay, that's the, that's the dimensionalities, uh, so to speak. So here is the, here is the situation in uh, SO3, a, a classical example, which was uh, known to Euler already, although maybe not in this language but essentially the, the results. So here, the, the, the group is SO3. The, the, the dual of the Lie algebra is R3. The, the Poisson br bracket is given, for example, by this explicit formula. So the, the orbits are the spheres. So the coagent orbits or these submanifolds will be the spheres. And uh, the Hamiltonian will be uh, an, another quadratic form and uh, the, the level sets will be trajectories so we can analyze everything uh, completely as, as was done uh, by Euler uh, essentially. So we can think about this uh, in a much uh, simpler setting as, as is, uh, as is uh, also done in, in one, of the, uh, one of the papers by, by Arnold. One can, uh, one can think about it in, in the following way. Assume you have uh, some ODE and you have uh, some conserved quantities, say F and G. Let's think about F as uh, Hamiltonian and G as uh, one of these uh, conserved quantities. And then uh, the, the fact that they are conserved and they, oh, oh, they uh, provide the same effect, right? If you start at one of the level sets, you will stay on, on one of the level sets. And then you can again look, say, at the local maxima or local minima of uh, the function f on this level set given by the constraint g. And it's clear that if I have, say, if I have, say, a local maximum of f on one of these level sets, then that gives me strong stability properties of uh, of uh, my dynamical uh, 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 my evolution because simply the if I start close to the equilibrium uh, and the function f looks like that, I have to stay close uh, if f is concerned. So, and it works the same if you have, uh, if you have several of them. And uh, it's uh, uh, interesting also to, to look at it in, uh, in the context of, uh, of classical uh, constraint minimization. Right. The, the, so when we say, say we want to minimize f or maximize f subjects to the constraints given by g's, uh, then we use the Lagrange multiplier uh, 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 theory. So we we uh, introduce this Lagrange function, the critical point which before was constrained now becomes an unconstrained point of uh, this uh, function, and it's of interest. It, if you think about stability properties, so, so all these functions in our situation will be conserved functions. So if this, uh, you, you have a critical point of the, of the Lagrange uh, uh, function, and then it's of interest to know what's the nature of this critical point. For example, if this point is not only, say, a point of maximum 
on the constraint manifold, but a point of global, say a local, uh, uh, it's a local maximum in all these variables X, right? Not just constraint uh, to this. Then you have, of course, a very strong uh, thing for, for your stability properties. You can, you have a function in all in in x which uh, which is a local maximum not just constrained uh, to uh, to to this manifold but everywhere so that has uh, uh, this is very good for stability then so in general it's uh, it's of interest to know when you when you consider this critical point which you get from uh, from uh, the lagrange multipliers to know if it's uh, what's the nature of it, if it's like a global uh, maximum or global minimum, uh, or like that. So in in that connection, it's uh, natural to calculate this it's second variation, and uh, the the second variation which one calculates by by this formula, it's a completely straightforward formula. It it has also an intrinsic meaning. If you take the function f. Uh, say it has a local it, ha it has a local maximum at uh, at this point you constrain the function to this um, to to this manifold here then it has a critical point at a critical point the the hessian or the quadratic form uh, given by the second derivative is intrinsically defined right and uh, that's exactly what you get. Uh, this intrinsically defined Hessian of the restriction of the function is exactly the, uh, given by uh, this form. So uh, the, the there is also some uh, geometric picture behind it. Say if we if we think in uh, in terms of uh, say two functions f and g, you consider you consider the image of your of your face space in terms of this function of f and g. So it's uh, an image from the variable x to r2. The image looks something like that. So if you have a situation here, so this is say the maximum of f subject to this constraint of g, if you can touch like that, then you have a global extremum, even if you leave the constraints, whereas in this situation, you will have a, you will have a settle point. So we would like to uh, we would like to uh, use this for uh, for the stability analysis of uh, this situation of the Euler equation, which I was uh, which I was uh, discussing, and uh, the essential the main uh, result is it, it, that it can be done. The, there is a proof. Which you can use using these uh, geometric quadratic forms and so on, which uh, gives you uh, the the stability result. So let's uh, let's uh, define these. Uh, anyway, so now now the uh, Osin vortex. This is not the ring, or is it is it the Dirac delta or the ring? That I mean, you you can use it to use to to, to the to, to the or not the ring, not, not the, the, the original, just the original, yeah, okay. just just the, a different proof of the of, of, of the original, original one of the uh, original uh, result. So the Osim vortex is the one with the with the yes, yeah, so straightforward where where you have uh, you you will see that we will we, we are using still this uh, this assumption. So so this is more like a like a proof of concept Und that, understood. that you can. Uh, that you can, uh, instead of the old proof, you, 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 you have a new proof, uh, which you can do uh, with, uh, this, uh, uh, with this approach. Um, so we can, we can uh, define these objects, which we, which we had in, uh, in finite dimension, in the, in the context of Euler. So our, our phase space will be the, the so in, if, in the connection of the Osin or vortex, our phase space will be the space of, say, positive functions on R2, which are smooth and decay fast at infinity. Okay, so that's, that's our phase space. Now, the, uh, the energy, uh, let's, let's start with energy here. The energy is just the usual uh, uh, energy for, uh, for Euler, which is, however, we integrate the stream function against the vorticity. So it's the Coulomb, uh, energy of the of the vorticity, which is the uh, which which uh, seems to be the best thing to to do here, because if if the integral of vorticity is non-zero, then the usual kinetic energy is infinite, right? 
right? You you have uh, like a point vortex as infinite energy. So instead, we we work with this uh, Coulomb energy essentially, and it gives it just uh, works the same, gives the right equation and everything. Uh, then we have the the constraints. So so the constraints are these. Uh, uh, say what can be called the Casimir functions. So we take them as for, for each omega and uh, a fixed number A, you, you have the measure of the set uh, of, of values where, uh, where set of points where omega is above, uh, above A. So the, I think sometimes it's called the distribution function, right? So that's, uh, that's, uh, that will be our, our Casimir functions. And then the orbits, they correspond to the set of functions with a given distribution function. Okay, so you, you specify your orbits by the distribution function. It's not exactly uh, it's not exactly the same as taking omega and composing it with diffeomorphism because when you just do the measure theoretic uh, uh, orbits, you lose the topological information. Right? Essentially, essentially, it uh, it comes down to uh, to replacing the, the group of uh, diffeomorphisms, volume preserving diffeomorphisms, by, by the group of volume preserving, ma uh, of measure preserving mappings. So it is some closure of these, uh, of these uh, functions here, but it works well in, uh, in our case. So that, uh, that seems to be the, uh, a good uh, object uh, to consider here. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, Thing which is uh, which is very useful in this uh, in this uh, setting is in this uh, two dimensional setting is that uh, for each orbit it's easy to characterize the the maximizers of the energy the the maximizers are known explicitly and they are uh, say uh, radial decreasing rearrangement of uh, the function so. Uh, the the orbit consists uh, with functions uh, with the same uh, distribution function, right? The, the level sets have the same measure, and among those, the maximal energy is achieved uh, on. Uh, say, if you if you insist that uh, that uh, the functions are radial among a certain origin, there is a unique uh, function like that, which is uh, radial and decreasing, and that's where the energy. Uh, attains uh, the maximum, so so that uh, requires some some uh, non-trivial but standard uh, rearrangement uh, uh, rearrangement inequalities. So we are able to 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 we, we have a nice characterization of the set of uh, of the set of maxima, and then once you have such a such a function, then you can it's easy to characterize the the space to the tangent orbit and the orthogonal component. So. The, the cartoon picture is here. You have the tangent, uh, you have the orbit, then you have the tangent space. So that, that's the space of, if you do the Fourier decomposition in the angle, in, we are in two dimensions, so you can use polar coordinates in the angle theta, then those are all functions for which the, the constant term in theta is zero. Okay, so this is the, the, the orbit. And the orthogonal complement to that are the, the radial functions. So, so we have a good uh, decomposition of uh, the space, uh, of the tangents uh, space into uh, the, of, uh, of uh, say, uh, the tangent space of P into the tangent space of the orbit and the orthogonal, uh, and the orthogonal complement. I wonder, can you say something about the function spaces you're actually using? I mean, uh, you mentioned already. I mean, I, it's familiar. You know, the, measure, the one with measure, measure preserving uh, extension, but because uh, you're using you're using some functional analysis here. I, I will get to that in a second. So, so at the at the moment. Everything which I said uh, was smooth functions, which are fast decaying at infinity. Oh, okay. 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 So, so we'll that's uh, that. Now we have to exactly the the question which will be next. We have to get to the functional analysis. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, the uh, so so we first. Do the, the uh, analogy of all these functions, which which I was uh, discussing in a, in a, in finite dimension. So uh, there is a Lagrange function. So we have the energy 
minus, uh, so now the Lagrange multipliers are parameterized by A, by continuous parameter, and these are the constraints. So this is the Lagrange function. You can reinterpret it in, in this way, okay? If you want that the first variation vanishes, this guy is uh, the function here is given by, uh, by the data, by the uh, vortex and, and its uh, stream function. Uh, and you have a formula for, for the second variation. So this is still formal, not paying attention to, to function spaces. One can th think about say smooth, everything being smooth. And uh, so, so we have our Lagrange function, the, the first variation, which then uh, uh, it's vanishing determines what uh, this function uh, phi is here. And, uh, and then we have the second variation. So the second variation of this is completely straightforward. Arnold calculated this uh, formula where, while he was thinking about as an intrinsic second differential of H restricted to the manifold. Right, so so that's uh, but it's still the same formula as uh, as uh, we have in our case, and it is well defined uh, in our classes of functions because we assume that uh, omega is decreasing and uh, doesn't uh, the derivative does not vanish. So this is uh, these are the function. This this function here, uh, the 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 analogy of the Lagrange function, it it has some flavor of something like the free energy. Right, because this this is the energy of the vortex, it renormalized uh, in in some sense, and then this this looks a lot like some entropy uh, function of uh, the vortex. So the the formula is uh, h minus ds. So this is uh, like this s, and one can make a case uh, that uh, the statistical mechanical temperature here is negative. That's, uh, that's uh, what's uh, considered, for example, in Onsager paper. So, so this, uh, if, you, if you think about this as the right sign, is the energy plus the, uh, plus the entropy. So we call it uh, free energy, but we did not try to make any deeper connection to, to statistical mechanics. It's just a formal uh, thing uh, at this stage. So now getting to the function spaces. So there is this form, the, the Arnold form. If, uh, if uh, uh, even if we consider it everywhere, not just, uh, uh, not just on the tangent space, it's still given by the, by the same formula. So, so this function is, uh, this function is uh, negative. So we, we will write it as minus a, right? Omega is decreasing. Psi is increasing, so it's a negative function. We call it minus a. And then, then our function space in which we, uh, or, or at least one of our function spaces, which we consider is the L2 space with this weight a. Okay, that's where our stability analysis uh, will be uh, will be uh, going on. And uh, what, so, so on the because. Uh, we are at the maximum of the function, the, the, at least when we restrict this form on the tangent space, it should be negative or at least non-positive, right? Because that's, uh, that would be strange if it was not uh, the case. It does have two null directions, two very natural null directions, because if you consider the rearrangement, you can shift it in two directions and it's still a, a maximizer, right? So you have two uh, zero direction and uh, the directions. And our first result is essentially that on the tangent space, so this time when you are on the tangent space, that everywhere, that, that if you consider a complementary space to this uh, space of two dimension, uh, of, to this two dimensional space of zero, then the form is coercive. Okay, so with respect to this, in other words, you can say uh, away from this uh, natural two dimensional space, you have a spectral gap, so to speak, that uh, it, it really captures. Uh, it's it's uh, more or less the same situation as as in uh, as in uh, finite dimension. Now the the next uh, question is what happens if you go to the larger space? Okay, because it would be very good for our uh, stability analysis if the form was not only positive or, or negative on the tangent space, but also on the larger space. So the space which we which we work with, which is uh, sufficient for our purposes, is the space of all vorticities with zero average. Okay, that, that's uh, that's okay for stability analysis because the average is conserved by evolution. 
so of both Euler and Navier stocks. So uh, it's it's a co-dimension one subspace in uh, in the in the whole space. And for the Ossian vortex, one can show that uh, that actually this uh, this uh, quadratic form which we have here stays positive. Then. Okay, so it not only is positive on the on the tangent space. But it is positive also if you go to this much larger space uh, of essentially all perturbations uh, with uh, zero average. Uh, it, it's still coercive uh, as uh, before, but it's not it's not automatic. You have examples of uh, vortices where this is not the case. For example, if you take uh, this vertex, then it still will be positive on the on the tangent space. Uh, to the orbit, but if you go to the larger space, it will uh, it will have some negative directions. In other words, the uh, both the pictures which I was showing for for the situation with the Lagrange function are possible. Right? You can you can have. Uh, fortunately, in the situation where which we are looking for in the stability analysis, we have the favorable situation where. The Arnold form was not only positive on the or negative in this space on the tangent space, but essentially everywhere. I will I will talk about the proofs in in a, in a little bit, but uh, let me. Uh, so, so 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 one. So the, there's a the, the, there's a general statement that uh, the the right inequality is true so so the form will be positive on the, on on this orthogonal complement where we don't know that is positive it will be positive there if and only if a certain hardy type inequality involving this function h uh, a will be true so in general this inequality under our assumption is true for some constant h okay but uh, for our form to be positive we need to be true with c less than 1 Okay, that's uh, that's essentially. Th this is easy to uh, detect. Uh, one can uh, interpret uh, this uh, this question about the the positivity of the of the form on the, on a bigger tangent space uh, than uh, than uh, the tangent space to the orbit in the in the following way. So we are trying to maximize a certain function subject to to some constraints, say which. Uh, G is G, GJ is equal to CJ. Okay, so on each, let's say on each of these leaves, we we have a maximum, and the value of the maximum is uh, let's call it M. It will depend on it will depend on these parameters C, right? It's the value of the maximum on each of the each of the. So the 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 parameters C they specify on which leave you are. So you can complement them to uh, to full coordinates in the space by uh, by adding to them some coordinates on on these leaves in such a way that uh, that if that uh, the point of maximum here, which we assume we are in some non-degenerate situation, that the point of maximum will have coordinates zero, right? So then then uh, the in these coordinates the point of maximum of the orbit uh, of the orbit will be say c1 cm and, and zero okay and the value of the function will be of f will be exactly the value of the function c and then we can calculate the the hessian of uh, of our original function in these new coordinates okay and what you get is this is the second variation of the function on the orbit, right? Because the uh, y parameterize the orbit. So this is negative definite more or less by the definition. These non-diagonal terms will be zero. And here you will get the Hessian of this function f as a function of constraint. And this will decide about what is going on outside of, uh, outside of your uh, set of constraints. So th this is a, a standard, uh, say, finite dimension situation now it is interesting because uh, in uh, in this situation where we where we have the explicit characterization of uh, of the maxima you can uh, you can in fact do this calculation in our scenario in uh, in the infinite dimensional case and you can uh, you can uh, express our energy in uh, in these coordinates explicitly so so the uh, the uh, 
These are the analogs of our function C, right? These are the, the, the this is the distribution function. So that parameterizes uh, uh, the, the orbits, so to speak. And so the maximum should be the function of, uh, of this variable. And after some calculation, you can come up with an, uh, with an explicit formula uh, for that, uh, which is given, I, I'm just giving it as a curiosity. It, in, in reality, we don't really work uh, with it too much, but uh, it's, it's interesting that, that one has uh, such a formula that uh, you can, uh, essentially you have, uh, you have here, we, we have this function C, so essentially here you have the analog, uh, analog, analog of this function C, C is this functional of H. And it's given by some explicit integral. There is an explicit function which you, uh, for which you do double integral. I, this function is, it's, it's not important. So I, I, I don't spend too much time on explaining it, but let me just say, uh, let me just say this. Uh, this function looks much better than, uh, is much better than it looks. It's almost C2. Uh, function and so if the function which we have was uh, uh, say if the if the maximum which we are looking at would be global so to speak not not just the constraint one but uh, but everywhere in space this function should be concave right that's that's essentially what we have and in some sense it's trying to be concave you can you can see that the, it is trying to be concave in the sense that for example it is separately concave and it is concave in the large uh, large portion of uh, the space but it's not concave everywhere unfortunately so it's uh, uh, you you have counterexample uh, counterexamples the, the landscape so to speak has some areas where it is not concave but it is uh, in some sense it is it it, uh, it, it is somewhat close to, um, to to being concave so uh, let me uh, let me explain the the difference between the two proofs uh, the the original one which we uh, which we have uh, at least I mean th there is one more thing which one has to which one has to discuss that's the role of viscosity and how everything which we have interacts with uh, viscosity so I'll get to that in a second but at least at the Euler level. Uh, here is essentially what is going on with the with the two proofs. So when one tries to to, to write the the linearized equation for for the for the linearized solution around our our uh, around our vortex, let's say it is described by omega bar and the corresponding velocity is u bar, and we we are looking at the linearized uh, equation. This is very classical. That's exactly what was done by uh, in the 19th century by uh, Rayleigh. And, uh, they they did not look at the linearized. They didn't study the, the behavior of the linearized equation. They just look at the growing moles, right? They just look at the at the spectrum and found, say, for Euler solution and the Ozine vortex, there's no negative, uh, no positive spectrum. So at that level. It is stable. Nowadays, you can also do the, the more uh, uh, subtle analysis of the actual behaviors of the linearized equation. And uh, uh, if one, so we are in a rotationally symmetric situation, so one can decompose into these modes. And in each mode, you have equations something like this you have eta is, uh, then is uh, ifa, and then you have. Two terms. You have the diagonal term a is some explicit function, and then you have uh, b times and this uh, this is uh, uh, a non-local operator. G is a self adjoint operator. Okay, so that's the linearized equation uh, for some specific mode a. So now what we do in uh, in our stability analysis uh, in our form is the following: we uh, we take this uh, uh, this term and pull out b, roughly speaking. I mean, one can interpret it uh, like that. Pull out b to the left here, and this what uh, what if you pull out if you pull out b, you get uh, this guy here, which is exactly the differential of the Arnold form. Okay, if you take the Arnold form, you see this ratio of the two functions. That's exactly what you have there. This is the non-local term, and so. Uh, you can interpret it, uh, it's, it's a linear equation. So we have a quadratic uh, uh, energy, okay? 
This is its derivative, okay? And this is in some sense, some symplectic structure which turns the, uh, uh, which turns the Hamiltonian into a vector field. And these are exactly the natural object. This is the, the uh, second variation of the natural energy. And this symplectic structure, which you have here is exactly the natural symplectic structure on the leaf, okay? Whereas the previous proof was done in a different way, okay? They took the B and they wrote it like that, okay? So they got a simpler, so, so the form, the quadratic form which they got was integral of eta squared over two B. So it has some serious advantages in that it is a local form, okay? It is, it is a local form here, this is a non-local. This is a local form, but it's not, like the natural form uh, related to the to the original uh, 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 energy there, and this now is uh, another symplectic structure, which is not the natural symplectic structure at the origin. So, of course, we we tried uh, to to adapt this. Not the, it's a huge advantage if you if you can work with a local expression like that, but uh, it seems we we convince ourselves that. Uh, it is only possible in a very limited uh, uh, range of situation, for example, in the essentially just for radial situation and for the shear force. Okay, that's where you can, uh, you can do this trick. This seems to be more robust, okay, using uh, this structure. So let me skip uh, this one. So how, how, does one prove these uh, coercivity estimates or spectrum gap estimates? Uh, essentially, uh, the one uses uh, sturm liouville theory and some comparison principle. So you have two quadratic forms. So you have, uh, this, is, uh, this is one quadratic form, this is another quadratic form, and you have to compare it, right? Which one is bigger or, or you, you're looking at, let's say, mutual eigenvalues. But after some change of variables, one can write it like this. This is one quadratic form. This is another quadratic form. And you have to be comparing those two forms. So at least uh, formally, it leads to some uh, ODE. For the eigenvalues, you get an ODE. For the eigenvalues, and so on. OK, where do you get an information about the ODE for the eigenvalues? So that's, that's, uh, that's the uh, question which one has to uh, deal with here. Fortunately there is some ODE information in the data, namely the, the, uh, the uh, function, the, the stream function and the vorticity function, they have to satisfy an ODE, right? And so if one looks, the, the right quantity, at least uh, from our perspective to look at, is this quantity, uh, the, the derivative of the stream function. It uh, satisfies this ODE, you, you see, if you, take, uh, if you take a derivative of this, you get a term which is omega prime, and then you, you can rewrite it in terms of this, term, of, of this weight A, which we have there. So essentially, if you take uh, this term here, you take V is equal to zero. Let me skip the role of V for now. This is somehow the ODE which we are interested in uh, for comparing eigenvalues. And this is the information you have. You know that this ODE, which is here, has a positive solution. Okay, so, so now the idea is to leverage this uh, information, bring this information from here into that equation and use the fact that you have a positive solution. So now when you bring it into this equation, you do a suitable change of variables, you find out that this functions, that there is a positive solution of this equation, this time written with V, okay? V is some function which you get from A. There is an explicit formula for that. And importantly, the, the coefficient which you have in front of here is one, right? That's our critical eigenvalue. If, if you are below one, then uh, uh, you are in good shape. If you are above one, uh, you, you don't have uh, positivity. So you have this, uh, this information here, so now, if uh, you control the sign of E, if you happen to know that uh, V is either positive or negative, you can use some comparison principle, essentially for quantum oscillator. If you have a quantum oscillator with energy V, uh, v if you increase V everywhere, the energy level will, uh, will increase. Okay, so that's, uh, that's essentially uh, what, uh, 
uh, what we use. Uh, and uh, that's uh, behind, the, behind the proofs. So uh, that requires some uh, calculation. One interesting thing perhaps is, is the following. So we have this uh, free energy and essentially what we, what we would like to know that our, our vortices, which we have, that they are not only constraint minimizer, but just uh, maximizers, but just maximizers of this free energy, right? So, so we start with the vortex, which we know is a, has a constraint maximizer of its energy. Now we construct the corresponding free energy and we would like to know that this vortex is now a maximizer without constraint of this free energy. That seems to be a very difficult question. We essentially uh, only have one example, not related to those which I, which I discussed, where we are able to determine that it is indeed a global, uh, a global uh, uh, maximizer. In general, you can show under some reasonable assumptions that they are global maxima. You can use the minimization and calculus of variations and so, so on and show that you have global uh, maximizers. One has to use some non-trivial uh, inequality, in particular the, the optimal hardy little uh, Sobolev inequality uh, there for that. But it can be done, but it's only implicit. We don't really know what these, uh, what these uh, minimizers or, or maximizers are. And uh, uh, it, even say the, uh, the ozine vortex itself, we are not able to, uh, to uh, we know it's a local, right? The Hessian has the right sign, but we don't know if it's a global, uh, uh, if it's a global uh, maximizer of the of the free energy. What is what is the example for which you know the global maximizer? The global maximizer is uh, related to the it's this uh, algebraic vortex with uh, exponent two. It's one over uh, one plus r squared squared. It's uh, related to conformal to some conformal geometry of uh -huh. the sphere and the uh, Onofre optimal constants in all of free inequality. So, so that one you can, so for that one, if you, the, in this potential, for that one, this potential V is zero. It's exactly zero. Uh -huh. uh, so one, uh, one gets some, uh, some nice uh, properties for that and you can determine, but it's not uh, anything which we studied, for example. The, the function which saturates the higher level? Yes, yes, that's right. So, that's uh, the, uh, this uh, part. Then one needs to deal. Sorry, one one needs to deal with uh, with uh, viscosity. Uh, so there is a similar story for viscosity. Essentially, you uh, one is interested for uh, in, in the interaction of this uh, of this Arnold form with uh, viscosity. If you do the calculation. Uh, you've, uh, uh, one is led to studying positivity of a similar form, except now it's shifted by one derivative. You have A times, uh, uh, I mean, integral of A times gradient of eta, and then minus some function B, which you get by calculation times this. So by similar methods as uh, before, th this is in fact slightly more, uh, this uh, gave us uh, somewhat more more trouble than the than the previous one. Uh, you can still show that it's uh, uh, the, that it's uh, positive uh, definite, and uh, then you can uh, then you can uh, use all this to uh, to show the stability uh, theorem based uh, on uh, this. That's uh, that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Uh, I have a question from afar, if that's OK. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so can, uh, can your proof say anything about the enhanced dissipation? So if you say take viscosity to 0, or alternatively, if you take viscosity equal to 1 and you send the circulation Reynolds number to infinity? So. Potentially, it can be probably used for stability analysis of the linearized oil. Right? We have not tried to, of course, in the nonlinear case, that, uh, that's not even known by any proof, I think, in the, in the radial setting, even though people are close to, I, I think. 
but uh, for the linearized equation, I would say yes. Sure, one, can totally use, one can use this for stability analysis, you know, get some estimates for the linearized equation, but we have not tried to, we have not tried to do it. Like the decay estimates for the sort of solutions of the linearized equations. Okay, thanks. And what happens if you go to the original idea that you wanted to actually do the ring? It should work, but it's uh, <laughs> it's a work in progress. Okay. I know that actually computer scientists, machine learners, especially do a lot of minimization, maximization studies, and like with the, the formulas that you're showing, some computer based, some mathematically. I was wondering if you've considered just reading some of their literature, just pure computer science, not just math. They have, uh, I mean, in, in general, this, uh, this convex optimization, there is, of course, huge uh, literature on this, like the Lagrange functions, you know, changing variables in the right way, looking at the utility function and so on. And, Taking so, so there is huge literature of it, and some of it is reflected uh, in. I mean, these are all, of course, classical uh, things. So some of it is uh, reflected, but only a minute uh, amount uh, of this. It's uh, the convex analysis. It's it's uh, it's a huge topic, of course. Thanks. So, in the last part about the number of stocks, um, the linearization of it is not self withdrawing right? How is this uh, quadratic, natural quadratic forms come? So, so the uh, uh, it's uh, it's true in. Uh, for example, in the original, it's not self adjoint but uh, in the it depends on the metric in or on on the scalar product. Okay, it can be self adjoint in the right scalar product if you change the scalar product. Okay, that's the then in the so so uh, essentially the the linearized equation is really of the form of the form. Uh, say anti-symmetric matrix, so the matrix, if you think about the matrix equation, in both cases you write it as a form anti-symmetric matrix times a symmetric matrix, yes. okay, which uh, gives you the, and uh, if the uh, if uh, the symmetric matrix is positive definite, then that uh, gives you, it, it's like Hamiltonian system with a positive definite uh, Hamiltonian, and it gives you conservation of, of that quantity. Okay, so you write this anti-symmetric case into the metric. So, so you, you write to the, the equation, essentially you have, uh, you have equation the x dot is then you have an anti-symmetric matrix and then you have some symmetric matrix, right? Like that. And then you can think of this as a, 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 a Poisson structure or whatever, the symplectic, and even though, I mean, you, it doesn't have to be okay, right? And, and this will be your conserved quadratic form. And in the linear case, you have several ways of do that, of, of doing that, right? When you can, you can, if you write this matrix as L, uh, so, then you have a nice, in, in the linear case, of course, it's simple. You have, it's possible if and only if the spectrum of L uh, is purely imaginary or something like that and simple. Uh, and then you can explicitly write out all the ways in which, uh, in which you can uh, do that. And uh, so the way we do it is one way, the way the original proof was done is another way. Okay, if there are no more questions, then let us thank Vladimir again. <laughs>